review. Now, I am perfectly aware, people, that uh, people have talked about this book already uh, many, many months ago. And I'm sort of late to the party because I'm in New Zealand. And frankly, uh, also too, I have decided to wait before I made a decision about this book. Instead of making a decision straight away, I would let it percolate a little bit. And I have let it percolate. Uh, the coffee is now ready. And therefore, I have my perspective of how this thing is going to sort of affect the community. <clears throat> and there is a reason why I purchased this book. And it's not the reason you might expect. But I will explain that after my presentation. Now, for those of you who think that today it would just be my face and I will talk. No, I'm not actually going to do that. I'm actually going to flip through the book because I always feel like you should see the product um, as somebody reviews it. I feel like this is the sort of thing I would look for on YouTube is I'm looking for somebody to show me exactly what is in the book as they talk about the book. And so that is what I'm going to do. I put up a poll. My suggestion to you is I'll do my presentation. I'll open it up and do a Q&A after and we can have a discussion about this book if you like. I have a few things here to show you um, that I sort of think will put put it all into perspective. But other than that, I think I'm pretty much ready. You will have to um, bear with me. I will need to take pauses through this presentation because I have a lot of notes. <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's get on to our main presentation for today because uh, that's why you're here, right? You're here for you're here for it. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm ready. Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Wheeler, and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, because I usually do talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And today's topic is Monsters of the Multiverse. This is a review of the Mordenkainen Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. Essentially, this is supposedly the second dedicated monster manual for Dungeons and Dragons 5e. We have had other books that had monsters in them, but they were a collection of other things as well. So you either see this as the second book or the fourth book in a series that has been going on for a while. Now, I'm going to say right now, I am going to flip through and show you everything as I discuss it because that's what I generally like to see when somebody else is doing a review and I'm going to do exactly the same thing for you, okay? Uh, first off, I do want to say that uh, my view of this book is affected by the fact that I have already got uh, a lot of the books that Wizards of the Coast has put out, okay? So firstly, my summary of this monster book that could have been a great book and should have been an awesome book, and I wanted it to be fantastic. This book is in fact very lazy. I consider it substandard. Now I do not mean that the artwork is bad or that the writing is bad or anything like that, but I will explain, give me time. I also consider this, the, a lot of this book to be quite boring. Uh, it's A lot of it's recycled, but more importantly, a lot of this book is actually now obsolete, like literally, obsolete. Uh, this book is primarily a dungeon master tool, but it does include 33 playable races for character creation. Ultimately, the book was a designing strategy, uh, well, designed around marketing strategies to cash in on 2021 Christmas Rush. And, and unfortunately, the book missed the date that they needed to release it on due to printing and shipping issues, and therefore it wound up being released after the intended date. Uh, this book actually exists for Dungeons & Dragons Adventurers League Public Organised Network Gaming or Play. Uh, and this, the, why did they do this? Because it was getting out of control. Literally, things were definitely getting out of control. So I think part of the reason for this book existing is that. Is that. The designers also used this book to showcase how they would present future stat block um, design for the Monster Manual in 2024. Um, 
This look at the future design by Wizards of the Coast is rather concerning for me because Jeremy Crawford has stated this is the new monster stat block design method, but the monsters are actually very weak and quite boring. Uh, the book brings together two different hybrid books uh, into, into this, uh, and it's supposed to be designed around, I think, new dungeon masters rather than anything else. There are a couple of other books that are pulled from for the races, but ultimately in terms of monsters, we're only pulling from two specific books. The playable races, rebalancing the playable monster races has been achieved, but the updated races are, are different. Uh, will people still want to play these races? That's my question. Races have complete flexibility around all of the ability score increases as set out in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Uh, personally, I would have preferred one of the ability score increases to be assigned to a specific ability when it made sense for the race's biology. I don't require it to have complete restriction, um, but I also think that they don't want complete flexibility either. All the major abilities for the races are built around using um, them a number of times equal to the proficiency bonus and then you recharge those uh, those features and get your proficiency bonus worth back on a long rest. Frankly I don't care about that. Um, it's just a different form of tracking with an arbitrary determined uh, limit to it. Like it, it there's, there's no sort of mathematical thing beside it that says this is the best way to do it. Um, a standardized speed for all of the races doesn't make sense to me but the designers are aiming to keep the the party together like so they're not spread out and avoid customer backlash. I think part of the problem with a lot of the design ideas behind there is customers not being happy with uh, the design of something and so for if you make enough noise then you change it. Uh, one of the things that really um, annoyed me and this is not the case for every single race but the playable kobold race has no pack tactics or light sensitivity. I expect if I'm playing one of the monstrous races that they actually perform mechanically like the monster and they don't here. <laughs> I mean you might say they're very similar but they just don't. Many of the playable monster races aren't like the monsters that they are based off mechanically and I would have I would have to say you have to do significant adjustments to have them resemble the original monster they were based off. Not all of the updated races have this issue. In fact, um, I would say there's probably only a handful amongst the 33 uh, races available. Will the updated race options replace the old ones? Absolutely, and it should be obvious that it was going to take place when it was first released. Uh, it was definitely going to do that. Uh, no playable races should be in this book, in my opinion. Uh, what should have been in this book for players because you don't have to worry about getting players to buy monster books, they will do that. Uh, they should have included plenty of beasts, new beasts that weren't in the original monster manual and that were in the other books that were printed, and creatures to summon, and uh, beasts or creatures that they can transform into or use as familiars or as animal companions. That would have been the smartest move, rather than including um, playable race options, in my opinion. The monsters. Almost all of the monsters in the book are repeated from Volo's Guide to Monsters and Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. What this book should have included was every monster from the Dungeons and Dragons 5e supplements not in the monster manual in my opinion. Like all of the pages that we used for the playable races should have been dedicated to including them and, and if they couldn't get them all in they should have picked the best ones. The only new monster in here is the Dolphin Delighter, which is quite stupid, it's unexciting, it's not really wanted, did anybody actually want it, it's not needed, it made me very angry that it was in fact included when I could have thought of many other monsters that they had that would have been far more interesting to include in this book. Alignment has been listed as typical for a creature rather than just being spelled out, this is how it is, which is fine because people change these anyway. <laughs> The proficiency bonus is now listed on the stat block, which can help if you don't know how to figure out the uh, the monster's bonus or um, proficiency bonus by looking at uh, the table in the Dungeon Master Guide. So that's fine. I don't think it was a big issue. A few monsters have a reduced list of uh, 
damage resistances that can't be avoided by making magical attacks. So um, if they had damage resistances in the past, a lot of them have been reduced, so there is fewer of them. But what I did like about uh, the fact that damage resistance for some of these monsters, you can't um, avoid that damage resistance. You can't um, circumvent damage resistance by wielding a magical weapon or making magical attacks. I like the concept the designers were going for, I just think the application was rather tame. Most of the monsters are short on hit points, some are as much as 100 hit points when I compared them with the table that apparently the mass is revolving around. So I did some calculation, try to figure it all out, and that's a lot of hit points to be short on. Many of the creatures need the damage per round doubled, rather than having what they have, they just don't do enough damage. Monsters with spell-like abilities that aren't considered spells is confusing and can be count uh, can't be counterspelled, which will annoy players and it's really kind of inconsistent. Um, this is a feature that I've seen in 4E and uh, the intention behind it was to actually make it easier to figure out how to use their main attack, you know, if they had a spell. Like, this is the one they're probably going to use the most. Let's explain it and put it include it into the stat block so they don't have a look it up. Uh, magic resistance doesn't work the same way as, as explained in the uh, original monster manual and that will generate confusion by having different types of magic resistance with different kind of mechanics for, for all your monsters that's a bad idea. Some monsters have been given bonus, um, bonus actions that can be used on the same turn which just really require the monsters to have access to more than one action. Like, monsters don't have to fo um, follow the same rules as the player characters, okay? <laughs> you can just say, okay, we're going to give them more than one action, and then let that happen. There have been minor changes to the monster st stat blocks, which are inadequate, in my opinion, to compete with the new player character options available now. Uh, stat block design is meant to include a big improvement. Apparently there was supposed to be a big improvement because everybody was um, crushing the monsters. But it hasn't occurred and it appears to be making 4E mistakes. Now if you've never played 4E you won't know what I'm talking about. But I can assure you there are a lot of mistakes in terms of design here. Monster lore is a mixed bag. There are some cases where there are no changes. Um, some monster lore has been reduced. Uh, some has been slightly adjusted or altered which is fine and some has actually been expanded, much to my surprise. It really shows the designers of this book don't want to add more story to the monsters, just rewrite, reduce uh, what has already been created in the past. Ultimately, if you look at the book overall, they haven't really expanded that often. It has happened, but not that much. The book reeks of probably the worst type of monster book design I have seen, large stat blocks, um, smaller art, I, I always felt like it was smaller art, but actually when you compare it to the original books, it's not really small, it's just my imagination maybe. Uh, minimal lore, and really when I say the worst type of monster um, book design, I'm talking at 4E. 4E has got to, got to be have some of the worst monster books that, out, that have ever been made by any com um, company, whether it's TSR or Wizards of the Coast. Overall, the stat blocks are significantly weaker than the quick monster creator table uh, which is in the Dungeon Master Guide, which means that a Dungeon Master will need to make major adjustments to the creatures for them to be a challenge for your players. And that's unfortunate. Now the formatting and layout of this book. The cover is kind of an odd collection of a wizard, uh, which is Mordenkainen, and an, an astral dreadnought, and a Kyrene, which I didn't really see as a, is that a good combination? The interior artwork looks recycled from the first printing for Dungeons & Dragons 5e with a few additions. Like there's a lot of art here that is definitely um, recycled, which is fine, you know, if you, it, it's expensive. Um, they have definitely added additional art that was not there before, which is always nice to see. I didn't find the Tasha's or Mordenkind and quotes entertaining, educational or even fun or funny, uh, but instead rather annoying and kind of like a waste of space. They use a lot of space for that stuff. There is only a contents page in this book, there is no index, but in this case, it doesn't need it. And that's fine, I, uh, this is one time where I'm not going to give Wizards of the Coast a hard time because they don't have an index, because this book doesn't need it, it's all in the contents page. The appendix with the monster lists for challenge rating, monster type, 
and environment is a is reasonable information. I actually thought they did a good job. I thought that was a smart idea. Organizing the monsters alphabetically is also smart design uh, conceptually, but it will confuse some people who are looking up demons and devils who don't actually specifically know the name of the demon or devil and they were just looking for a demon and a devil and then they go through the demon and devil section to find what they wanted. <laughs> Deciding to remove the bolded text that indented the monster law was a mistake in my opinion because it did make it easier to read. Uh, Wizards of the Coast is signaling with this, um, this book a new edition, okay? Uh, it was obvious when I saw it come out, I knew this was going to happen. But also a new focus on moving away from the Forgotten Realms to multiple worlds. Uh, not just multiple wor worlds and a multiverse, but also including a lot of Magic the Gathering. I expect to see a lot of that in the future. Who is the book designed for? This book is for collectors. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons Adventurers League organized public games. Uh, there aren't enough player options for it to be worth a player to purchase, with really only maybe 25, 26 pages of um, playable races in here. And even if you look at the beasts and creatures, there's only a few beasts and creatures they could use in this book, unfortunately. This appears to be a beginner's Dungeon Master monster book, till you realise how much work it will create for them in the long term. Initially, when they run these monsters, they probably won't notice anything. Uh, but then they will actually have to make adjustments. Experienced Dungeon Masters will hate this book because they'll know how much work they have to go um, go to to actually fix a lot of the stuff. If you don't have Volo's Guide to Monsters or Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, you might love this because you won't know what you're missing, uh, frankly. So if you've never picked up those books, never seen them, you won't know that you're actually missing out. The monsters in this book are already obsolete in my opinion and they have been for some time, and will be obsolete for sure in 2024. Possibly the races as well. I don't think that the races presented here will be suitable for 2024. Particularly with all the changes occurring with 1D&D and the new version of Dungeons & Dragons coming. So my summary for this book. Dungeon Masters have lost access to monster layer information, layer maps, monster tactics, monster roleplay advice, minions, monster story and treasure that they would have. Players of characters have lost race story, lore suggestions and uh, character race concepts that they could have included when they were creating their character. With everything that has been removed, condensed or changed, people would be actually foolish not to give Wizards of the Coast double the money they're asking for for this gem of a book that they have created. Can I just say, this is not a good book. And I'm really sad to say that that is the case. I was expecting a lot more from Wizards of the Coast and I just did not get it. And we deserve more. We have seen third party publishers do far better than this and Wizards of the Coast are, are experts. They should be able to handle doing this without ballsing it up. And I feel like this is a missed opportunity big time. Now, please let me know in the comments uh, what you think of this book, uh, if you have anything you would like to add. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Okay, just bear with me. I'm coming back to my face now, people. Um, and I think I will flick on some lo extra lighting because I feel like I'm in the dark here just a little bit. Um, just give me a second while I just check that my camera is actually focused. Is it focused? Can you see me clearly? Yeah, I think you can. I don't think I have to adjust that. Anyway, let's go to chat and back to my face. Now, for those of you who were expecting me to be super positive, look, it's not all negative. There, there are some things, there's things they've done with this book that are good, for sure. And there are things here that they could have done a lot better. If you, if you look at some of the books put out by Cobalt Press and other publishers, they, they're knocking it out of the park. And this book just doesn't do that. 
<laughs> uh, I, I'm sorry to say, it just doesn't do what it needs to do. Anyway, let's have a look at the, uh, the, the poll first. Did you buy Monsters of the Multiverse? Yes, 40%. No, 47%. Thinking about it, 7%. Just watching, 7%. Okay, all right, I'm going to leave that open. There's 15 people who have voted. Um, I am VPH Panther. Hello, I am VPH Panther. Welcome. Now, for those of you who are, are like, Fred, wasn't this scheduled at 12? It was an error on my part. Sometime, it was it was supposed to be scheduled at 10 a.m. on Friday in New Zealand. And for some reason, um, I must have ballsed up and put it down as 12 p.m. in New Zealand on Friday. For North America, it would be... So it's <laughs> if, you, if it got a little messed up and you're like, Fred, what happened with the scheduling... Um, yeah, I, 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 either I made a mistake or YouTube did something, I don't know. Hello, Nacho Nacho Man. Nacho Nacho Man is a patron, supports me on Patreon, and I do thank you for doing so. Um, welcome to the live stream. Uh, Andy, hello, how are you? How about the new, um, T-Swift? What's the new T-Swift? You have to explain to me what the new T-Swift is. I'm not too sure what the new T-Swift is, is all about. Hello Seeker, how are you? You've been looking for me to do reviews. This is the beginning, um, Seeker. I will be doing more reviews and they will be under the same sort of format. I will talk as I flip through the book so you'll see everything as I go. Um, so, look, there are some people who are going to be happy with this book and other people who won't. But what I'm going to do, because I need to present my case, because I've just said a whole lot of stuff, and without context, it's like, have, have we lost something here? If you think about it, this book here, what would you have preferred? Would you have preferred the way they've done it, or would you have preferred for them to take all the monsters, maybe not been able to get all the lore in there, but at least gotten some lore on the monsters, and put in more monsters in the book? I, I can assure you, that players buy monster books. I've said this many times before. It is one of the things outside of the player's handbook and other books that give them player options that they will buy because monster books give them player options because of the very things I talked about, such as summoning creatures, uh, transforming themselves, um, using familiars and having animal companions, and there are other ways of using the monster book again. So, I, again, they're not going to use the Dungeon Master's monster book because they are using it. Do you know what I mean? So, they will need to buy their own, uh, frankly. Okay. You have a love-hate relationship with this book, yeah. And th this is the thing. is we're in, you're, I'm in love with the concept that I might have been able to get a really good book out of Wizards of the Coast, and I didn't get that. Do I want to make my own D and D character sheet? Um, not right now, because I'm doing a book review. <laughs> Hello, Andy. What do you got here? Um, I had to buy it just for the updated goblins and El Ladrin and Durga. Uh, so let me explain why I bought, bought this book because I wasn't going to buy this book. The reason I wasn't going to buy this book is I didn't need it. I had Volo's Guide to, um, um, to Monsters, and I had Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, which are superior to this book in every way. In every way. I mean, you can say, okay, the, mon the, the monster stat blocks have been adjusted, but the kind of changes they have made are insignificant to the changes that I have had to make to monsters. So they haven't, they're, not, they're so far behind the ball, it's not funny. Okay, so here's, here's the thing um, for me. I bought this because I knew I was going to be running character creation for Dungeons and Dragons 5e or 5.5 and therefore I would need to have the stats for those races in a book to refer to, refer to when I was building characters because as the new generation come through they're not going to be using the old um, player character races they're going to be using the new stuff in the Monsters of the Multiverse. That is what um, Wizards of the Coast wants you to buy. They're going to stop printing the old books. They're going to, they've made it unavailable on DMT Beyond. If you've already bought it, you've got it. But if you, you can't buy it now, it's gone. Okay, you don't access it. They don't want you to buy it online. They want you to buy this book. So 
I realized I had to buy Monsters of the, of the Multiverse just to be able to run my beginner character creation live stream every week. That is the only reason I purchased the book. Doing a review of the book, I do because reviews never do me any good. I always find they are they generally a complete waste of time for me, but I know they're good for people because they get a lot of detail from me. So I know that people want me to give you a, a, a give out a review. Um, but ultimately, I always find them to be not that that great. Um, it's more for me a service to the community. Okay, um, so let's have a look else. Look at what else we got here. Um, Nacho, I really love the Fey ancestry that added to to goblins. So goblins have already always been fairy like um, creatures or Fey anyway. So for those of you who are like, okay, this doesn't fit with the Dungeons and Dragons lore. If you go and talk to AJ Pickett or watch any of his videos, he will explain this already. I don't think you need to be caught up and worried about that sort of thing. I mean, if you don't want your goblins to be fey, then don't have them be fey. But ultimately, goblins have always been fey in um, folklore anyway. Seeker. I brought it through um, Gritted Teeth. I bet you did, Seeker. Uh, like the idea of easier to run monsters, at least, apart from the counter spell business. Yes. So for you as dungeon masters, when you get to the situation and you've got a feature that's spell-like but not actually a spell, just let the players counter spell it, okay? <laughs> it is just going to it's going to make life so much easier. Um, I I think it was a mistake to I, I mean if the designers were thinking about this clearly, what they would have done is said anything that is a, listed here as spell like is actually a spell and you can counter spell it. It's fine. You can do that, okay? Um, they're not actually spell like. They are just spells, and we've just given you the information on it, and just leave it at that. I think what they're trying to do is make sure the dungeon master is allowed to actually do something with their monster. That's why the spell-like abilities occur, uh, because otherwise it's possible for a group with enough spellcasters and counterspell to counterspell everything, shut down the monsters completely that it's cast spells, and then just ruin the entire encounter. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm going to show you Volo's Guide to Monsters, people, today, as part of the live stream. I'm going to show you the Tome of... Um, foes, modern kindness tome of foes, and I'm going to point out the things about those books that make them great, but they are not actually the key reason why I have an issue with this book. There are a lot of adventures and other supplements that had really cool monsters that should have made it into this book. Do you know what I mean? They should have been there. Um, right, so uh, Nacho Volo's Guide is my favorite monster book. I love the lore section. So. I'm going to, because I know people will not have access to Volo's Guide to Monsters, I'm going to, I'm going to be basing a lot of my Dungeon Master prep, particularly the locations, on a lot of the layers. There's a lot of layer information on monsters in Volo's Guide to Monsters. Like, it gives you a write-up of what they are, that what they're like, it gives you uh, maps, and that's lost information to the new generation, because they won't be able to access that. It's actually really good. Seeker, you're wondering why I say 4E mechanic, mechanical mistakes. One of the issues with 4E uh, in terms of uh, monster stat blocks was complexity and the size of the stat block. As the size of the stat block got larger and larger, and they did, they got very large, some of those stat blocks. They had lots of really cool features. It was hard to keep up with them because often they would have too many things going on, and so you would forget anyway. Okay, You would forget that the monster had those, those abilities. The other thing that was problematic about 4E, and they're starting to duplicate it in uh, the monsters of the multiverse, is that uh, you would have you would have a a larger stat block, and as a product, you simply could not include that much monster lore, and so there was so little information on the monster, it was actually very difficult as a dungeon master to figure out how to incorporate the monster into your story or your adventure. Monster stat blocks alone don't actually help. You actually need the look. Most, I, I've done. I was part of the alpha play test, not part of the beta play play test. I was part of the people who tested the alpha play test for the, the original monster manual for Five E. My name is in that book, and I can assure you what made the difference when we were play testing is when they gave us the law. They never gave us challenge rating, they, but when they gave us the law, it all started to make it possible for me to understand how to do something with a monster. 
it, it, you know, one of the things that we lose that, that, are, that is not in the Monster Manual or in the Monsters of the Multiverse is tactically, how do we use the monster? How do you go about using the monster effectively? A lot of that information is in um, Volo's Guide to Monsters and and uh, not so much in Mordenkainen's um, Tome of Foes, but definitely in Volo's Guide. Definitely in Volo's Guide. Okay, so uh, now... Nacho, it sucks that they removed Volo's Guide and Tome of Foes on DNT Beyond. I think that was a mistake. I think they should have left them there. I don't think that was uh, a good move. Tui Monster Manual reigns supreme. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to dispute that, um, Scott. Hello, Scott. How are you, um, Scott? I have to say that the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Second Ed Edition uh, Monstrous Manual is one of the best monster books out there. I have it still. I went and I gave it away like an idiot, and then I went back and I had to buy it again. Um, and I wound up buying exactly the same book from from one of my friends. Are all the adjusted monsters easier than the original 5e variants? Um, no, I wouldn't say that they are. I, I, I mean, they certainly try to uh, make it easier to run those monsters, but you know, they, they, they really aren't. Um, I don't think that there's significant changes to actually consider them worthy of a change, frankly. Some of them have had pretty significant changes, but some of them, I mean, literally, I looked at the book and compared it with the original books, and you can see that they have literally just plucked them off the page and just placed them back on to a different page and a, a different, you know, when they were making this book. The formatting is so similar, the positioning is so similar, um, and then maybe the only thing they've ever done is just take out the bold section in the, the law text, and that's it. Like, they literally almost looks identical in some cases. And that's not good. <laughs> um, okay, very lucky. You know, to hear an example of the two of the kinds of fixes which are required. Um, Seeker, I, I look, I, I'm... So here's... For those of you who want to have fixes of monsters on the multi, of the multiverse, I'm, I'm not going to fix... Go, go over how to fix monsters monsters of the multiverse i will explain very generally how i go about dealing with fixing monsters but that's not going to deal with all of your monsters here okay um, i already do monster lore every week and part of monster lore is the monster workshop and the monster workshop is designed to rebuild the monsters in the monster manual the original monster manual that's going to take me a long time people because there's a lot of monsters in there so once I've finished doing that, I am happy to move on to Monsters of the Multiverse. But here's the problem. Will I have to do that again in 2024 for the Monster Manual because uh, people are using the original Monster Manual for 2024 that gets released? Or are they using the old one that was released in 2014? It's going to create a bit of hassle. So we'll, we'll see. It's going to be a changing landscape, that one. Okay? Um... But I, I will, Seeker, I will give you some advice around this. Hello, I'm Pat Sheward. Pat Sheward is a patron, been supporting me for a long time. Hello, how are you? He's also a moderator because he's been with me for so long. More than the uh, the six months that he said he would be um, supporting me. And I do, I do appreciate it, Pat. Hopefully you agree with all the changes I've made on the channel and the way that I'm running things. I think it's the right way to go. Um, anyway. Uh, I learned that the hard way about uh, letting a player be an Aarakocra. Yeah, so so one of the things about an Aarakocra, just because a race of, uh, exists doesn't mean that all the players should be able to play that race. I, 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 want, I want my players to have the opportunity, when it's appropriate, to play an Aarakocra that flies and operates like the original monster. I, I want my players to be able to play a kobold, when it's appropriate, that plays exactly like the monster. And for me, I'm going to change those races back to what they should be. Because that's where my head's at. Um, I know none of the players in my group, my home group, care two squats for the playable races in here. Which is a sad thing. <laughs> um, and I don't have a huge issue with the flexibility around ability scores. But I would like some races to be sort of have something hard baked into them. Even if it's a plus one to something would have been fine in my head because it helps sort of like, okay, they should be kind of a bit better at this sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? 
And biology does affect how well you do something, you know. Monkeys and apes are stronger than humans because of how their muscle fibers are set up. So we can apply the same sort of concept. And, and yes, the original designers of D&D were, put a lot of restrictions in there based off lots of different reasons, but often it was around balance and, and other things, you know. Um, I know people get caught up and say, you know, um, Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax were just, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> beating up on women and uh, all about restrictions and prejudice. But actually, Gary Gygax played with his kids and he had um, he had daughters and sons who played. In fact, his daughters probably played more than his sons. <laughs> OK, OK. Um, yes, you might find that I don't like it. <laughs> if you had to get one th third party book uh, I, I recommend I recommend the original tome of um, Tome of Beasts by Kobold Press the original one not the second one the second one's not that great in my opinion but the first one the, the mechanics behind the monsters is fantastic they are they're really impressive they're cool monsters they do fun things uh, they're not boring uh, and that's that's really important. If you have a monster, it has to do something that's interesting. Hello, uh, McLovin. How are you? Yes, I could be up to something. Absolutely. Something is up. Could be. Um, hello, Dan. How are you? Dan is also a patron, supports me on Patreon, and has been for some time. And I have to thank you, Dan. He's also a moderator, if you haven't figured it out. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so I, I'd, as, as I said, um, the Tome of Beasts by Kobold Press, the original one, is probably the best one. I Look, those books always sold out really fast. They were hard to get a hold of, and they were expensive. I had to pay top dollar to get those books, but they were huge, and they were so impressive. Scott, I'm not Fred, but I like Monsters uh, Monsters Know What They Are Doing. It is a good book too, yes. The Monsters Know What They're Doing. That's tactical stuff. Uh, you need to get back to work, Nacho. Not a problem. Thank you for coming, uh, Nacho, patron. Thank you for supporting me on Patreon. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I need to reference something. Hello, Wally. How are you? Great choice. I enjoy the monsters from the uh, all of the Cobalt Press books. I've, I've used the Ocular Swarm many times. So for those of you who are unaware of Wally DM, me and Wally know each other pretty well. And uh, when, when I was doing this, I have watched Wally's review many, many times. And so, um, Monsters of the Multiverse. I'm going to start f flicking through and showing you, this is a very good review. A slightly different perspective. Um, Wally is not nearly as brutal and ruthless as I am uh, with regard to a review. I am probably, uh, I, I, you know, when I don't like something, I, I, I'm not expecting Wizards of the Coast to ever send me anything, okay? Cobalt Press does a really good job. So I've, I've put in a link to uh, Wally's uh, original YouTube video that he did a review on. So you go and check him out because it is... It is a good one. Now, here, here's where I want to go now, people, is this is where we are at. It is time to actually show you what you're missing out on. For those of you who have never seen Voldo's Guide to Monsters or Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, let me show you what you have never going to be able to get access to because the books are going to go out of print. Like they're not going to reprint them again. And you won't be able to get them digitally because they won't be available on D&D Beyond. In fact, you probably won't even get them on something like uh, drive through RPG because they're probably not going to put them there. They're probably going to like, no, we don't want people to go to that book. So here we go. Let's take this book and I'll show you what you're missing. And you'll tell me if I'm wrong. Now, I'm not suggesting even remotely that the stuff in here should have gone into Monsters of the Multiverse. What I am suggesting is that by not making these books available to people, okay, 
even if it's digitally, it was a, a mistake. Uh, that they should be available to people because the stuff that's in here is gold. It's really, really good stuff. So <clears throat> do not get rid of those older books, people. When you get books, you do not want to get rid of them. It's just not a good idea. <laughs> you want to hold on to them always. Uh, Githyanki, your wife made a Githyanki uh, paladin from the book. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, here, here's, here's the monster law section. Let me just show you what you've got. This is the first section that we start off with beholders. Now, imagine that you haven't got enough information on beholders to develop a story, but it talks about all the different beholders. Okay. It gives you a way of modifying all of your beholders, which you could probably do yourself without having these tables. Absolutely. I agree. But battle tactics. Your battle tactics. How many times have you looked at the beholding like, I don't really know how to run this thing? Well, it explains how to do that. When and how to use your anti-magic um, freely, you know? How to use the different eye effects and why you'd use them and how you'd go about using them. Um, all of the rays are discussed here. You can even swap them out for something else and do some variations on here. Um, developing escape tunnels for your lairs. The lair itself... Um, will have minions in different sections and it talks about the different layers and sections within there okay it's literally there and guess what you get a map now I'm pretty sure that the um, the one that we have for Mordenkainen's uh, presents Monsters of the Multiverse included this map which is great but you don't get all of the other written text this is all the stuff you really need so do you know what I'm going to do I'm going to steal all of this and then I'm going to turn it into a slideshow for you and we're going to actually use it to make our own map since a map like this is a little bit hard to run so we probably need something that's a bit more functional, right? Um, it talks about what treasure you would find in the lair. So imagine that you have that. It talks about minions, what sort of pets they have. It, it helps you fill it all out. Division of labor, labor, what sort of paranoia they go through. This is all really good stuff. And then they do that for just about every single monster, major monster you could imagine. Beholders are a big deal for people, right? Then we talk about giants, and it does that for giants. Same sort of thing, what you'd find in a giant bag. It fills out all of the bits and pieces you don't get in the monster manual, and you don't get in Monsters of the Multiverse. Okay? So not having access to that is, is such a pain in the ass, because... Now you have to rely on the likes of AJ Pickett, Mr. X, myself, uh, Dungeon Dad, um, Dungeon Cast, and everybody else who does monster lore to talk about this stuff and give you this information, which we may not be able to do in a video. It may simply be impossible to do that. Um, we're talking about gnolls here. gives you a lot of information on gnolls. Goblins, goblinoids. doesn't just give you that. It goes over all of the goblins. Hobgoblins. And we will wind up at some point here getting a map of our goblinoid war camp. Now, wouldn't that be useful to you to have a, a layout of what the, the goblinoid war camp looks like? Again, not necessarily needing to go into Mordenkainen's Tome of Foe, um, into um, Mordenkainen Presents Monsters of the Multiverse, but at least make it available to the next generation so they can use this stuff. I know a lot of people were like, nah, this isn't very good stuff. I'll never do your do I ever use it? But seriously, you know you will. You know you will, because you can literally build an adventure around it. They give you the map and the locations. So here's a hags layer. So you get a whole lot of information on hags. Now you get a layer, you get a breakdown of what the different um, locations within the hags layer are like. So that gives you some information around that. That's quite useful too, frankly. Okay being able to give you that sort of information, what sort of minions they would have. Now, kobolds look, uh, tend to be hang out with dragons, right? And we, we're going to put dragons in our uh, adventure for sure. So we need to know what sort of things do, how do kobolds operate? What sort of tactics? Look at the area on the section on tactics. It's, all, it's half a page of tactics just on how you would actually use them. Yeah, what sort of treasure, what sort of allies? And then we get a kobold lair, this is the layer for kobolds. Now, this might be linked to a much, large, a much larger cave where a dragon lives, right? 
But this is the sort of thing you want. You want to know what, it, what the layout would look like. You, you, and it gives you that right here. You know, mind flayers are a big deal, right? You get all the stuff you need for a mind flayer in this book as well. And it goes on and on and on. And then suddenly we get this multi isometric looking um, diagram, which we've got no map for um, other than this. This is how a mind flayer colony is set out. Like this is gold stuff. Now, that may be included in Monsters of the Multiverse. I can't remember. I know there's at least, I think there's two maps they include, but not all of them. Um, and I think the loss of the maps and their descriptions, how to roleplay orcs is in here. You have an orc stronghold specifically. So not just a camp, but an actual stronghold. This map alone is probably going to solve a lot of your problems. So this is why I get upset Yuantia now talked about. These it's like these are all the major monsters that you would normally use. And a key, you get a Yuanti temple, and it gives you a breakdown, gives you a layout of the map, okay, and a lot of information about how to run them. And now we go into playable races. I'm not going to go into here. because This isn't really important as far as I'm concerned. All this stuff here, like, let's forget about that. Because you've already got a lot of this stuff um, in Morden Conan's, uh, Morden Conan presents Monsters of the Multiverse. What I would say is you probably have twice as much information on the playable races that are in Volo's Guide compared to the uh, the original this 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 new printing this um, Monsters of the Multiverse. So they have reduced a lot of that, which is I mean space. You can't make a book five hundred or six hundred pages long, uh, but that's what you lost from that book. If you don't have it now, you're probably never going to get it. How sad is that? Okay, but I'm not finished. There's another book here. Now, this one I dislike a little bit uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, and I think primarily the reason I have an issue with this book is it doesn't quite do what Volo's Guide to Monsters does. So here's all the stuff that you are now missing as a result of them not allowing you to purchase these books, even though they have printed Monsters of the Multiverse. Bear with me, I just need to drink some water. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> going back to my discussion, Tome of Foes, okay? Definitely, Volo's Guide to Monsters is better than this one, in my opinion. Okay, but there's still a lot of really inf important information in here that I, I think that you are going to wind up regretting not having access to. And let me show you what it is. So we get the Blood War. Now the Blood War is instrumental. This information is absolutely vital if you're going to have demons and devils in your game. And if your whole campaign revolves around them, uh, then you, you really kind of need that information. Because where else are you going to find it? Well, there isn't anywhere else to find it, unless you have older books, or unless you wind up going and watching AJ Pickett or somebody who talks about that sort of stuff. Because there aren't that many people who know that much information about it. Wizards of the Coast has got access to all of that. They've got everything, right? Talks about cult, um, cults, um, cults and different cultists. Uh, you have a lot of information that helps figure out how um, demons and devils operate. Um, what you don't get in this book, even though you do get a lot of the different, you know, a lot of the different um, major demons and devils are actually discussed in here. What you don't generally get, unfortunately, is you don't get a lot of maps. This is probably the one aspect of it that's sort of a shame. Now, that was that's for the dungeon master. Now, players, if you're playing the game, and let me get let me get 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 it absolutely clear with you. If you're playing the game, you're probably not quite that interested in all of that sort of stuff necessarily in terms of demons and devils. Dungeon Master's probably wanting that information more than you. But if you're playing an elf or some other race and you want a lot of lore around that, one some of the most popular videos that AJ Pickett has made or anybody has made are, are, are on not the monsters but on the playable races such as elves, dwarves, etc., and that's because he goes into the lore behind them. 
And I know players love that sort of stuff because it helps them figure out how to play the character more. They will add their own stuff, which they should do, absolutely. But they also want some of the lore to help them spark their imagination about what they can do. And this book actually does that. Because now we have a huge section that talks about how elves work, their society, how old they live, when they die, um, the elders, all that sort of elf stuff that you needed there, it's there. The different deities, like it breaks that all down, gives you a lot more information. Pretty useful for a player who's really invested in playing an elf, frankly. Now you might say, Fred, this is like far more than they really need. But is it? There are some players who do not um, get drawn to the game because of mechanics. I do feel that to a large extent the people who are more invested in the mechanics of the game are the ones who are filling out these goddamn surveys. Um, <laughs> and, and really those people who are more into the story are kind of getting left behind a little bit. Now Dwarves and Duragar. Now we have the the deep roots of war between them talked about. So now we're going to have a lot of information around uh, being brought up as a, um, a dwarf or um, what happened to the Duragar, the story behind them, um, how they, how how different are the dwarves in the multiverse is even discussed here. Like there's a lot of stuff. Dwarf religion. So if you wanted to flesh out your dwarf character and you were having trouble coming up with ideas, this is the idea bank. This is where you go to get all of that information. Of course you won't because you can't get it now, can you? Right? Okay. If you want to play Gith, I'm traveling the multiverse now. Gith in the Endless War. So we're talking about Gith, Gith Yankee. Uh, really, their, their battle with the, the Mind Flayers. This is really their story. If you weren't aware of how it all works, it's here. Because you get... Can you see how much information they have offered? Uh, this was designed to be a fluff book for players playing characters. It's also super useful if you're a dungeon master. Now what if you're playing a halfling and gnome? Some very popular races here. I am fired up, Scott, you are right. Okay, I'm in a bad mood, I, I agree. If, tell me to tone it down if I need to. Um, so if you're playing a halfling or a gnome and you didn't know very much about them because you didn't get that much information in the books that you have, well, it's here. Oh, other, other than that, you've got to go and watch AJ Pickett's um, videos, right? That's the other, only other way. Or become a patron so you can get all his documentation. This is a big deal. There's a lot of information here. I'm going to keep turning the pages till you get the point. Deep gnomes are even included. And then we stop. So some of the most popular races are discussed. Yep, absolutely vital for a player character and a dungeon master in many respects. That is almost half the book. Now we're on to beasteries. I'm not going to show you the beastry because you can get this now. It's in Monsters of the Multiverse. But the other half of the book, you can never access because they don't sell it anymore. It's gone. Uh, new generation. Sorry, uh, you have to figure it out yourself. Um, so... <sighs> I, I really hate talking about a book and saying something um, that should have been like, this book should have been the best book that Wizards of the Coast had put out for a long time. And I've noticed a, a really significant pattern within uh, Wizards of the Coast in terms, I feel like maybe they're printing too many books, their design team are trying to keep up with too much. Um, I suspect that part of the reason why this schedule and the type of products we're getting aren't quite right, is that their marketing surveys are not asking the right questions. When I think about those surveys, which is what's driving all of this, people, um, I suspect that the people answering the surveys are a very select part of the community. Because almost everybody that I know who plays Dungeons & Dragons, unless they're a YouTuber, they never know that, you, um, that the surveys even exist. They don't even know that 1D&D exists. I have to tell them about it. I'm the one telling them. They don't know. They've got no idea. They're never filling out the surveys. I ask my, If I ask all the friends in my group and people I'm connected to who play Dungeons & Dragons, and there's a lot, they don't fill out the surveys. The only ones who are filling out those surveys is those, those 
buddies that I have that are YouTubers that I hang out with because I'm part of the Dungeon Master Roundtable and I built that with Wally and um, as a result I communicate with a lot of them. Um, they know about it but the others don't and there are more than a few YouTubers who do D&D stuff who don't fill out the surveys because they couldn't give a shit. <laughs> Literally. Um, and I... <laughs> There are a few, um, and it's fine. I, I get it because they're not around. They're not really. They don't care about the mechanics. So, somebody had asked me, "How do I how do I solve some of the problems in this new book?" And I am all for answering that to a certain degree, because there's some things in this book that I noticed that I thought were actually quite clever. So. What I think is probably best is I'm going to put in a hashtag here and you're going to tell me, do you want me to show you the book and explain what I would do to sort some of this stuff out? Or do you want me to explain it and just use the head cam? Okay. Um, hashtag. Fixing the monsters. In, uh, fixing the creatures. How's the, we'll do that. Fixing the creatures. In Monsters of the Multiverse. Um, look at the book or head cam. Camera. So I think I've almost got this question in here. Fixing the creatures in multi, uh, monsters of the multiverse. Looking, um, look at the, look at the. <laughs> that's not the word book. Get the book, or head cam. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to type it in here. Apparently, I can also put up a question. Hello, Shiner eighty one. How are you? Welcome. Um, I'm putting in a quiz. Um, a Q and A question. I'll use this feature as well. Um, so do you want me to use the head cam or the book? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a short break because I've been talking for about an hour and I've been talking a lot. And uh, I'm going to let you guys decide what you want to say. Okay. Um, this is a new feature that YouTube is using. So we're going to uh, incorporate it today. And I'm going to take a short break, five minutes or less, I'll be back and we'll go into very a lot of detail, like a lot of detail, people.
climbing back into my chair. <laughs> okay. All right, transitioning back over. And we will see what people decided in the end with regard to how we're going to do this. Book doing it this way um, to test m my feature. Okay. All right. Well, then that's, that's fine. I mean, I, I have no problem with that. So one person's responded. Uh, nobody else has, which is fine. If you're, So we'll end this. Looks like I'm using the book. Confirm. Uh, now, uh, you were there today, da, da, da. would love a, a book on high intelligence monster tactics. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's, now I believe that Wally and, um, Wally DM, Mr. Trask and uh, Dungeon Dad are in the process of building a book around that kind of concept anyway. So maybe that's the way to go. Local store. <laughs> the book. It's the book. It's the book. Okay, let's do the book. Let's open the book. Let's make the book do the work. And I will uh, I'll point out, I'm probably going to flick the pages as I go. Uh, just so that we change the um, landscape a little bit. But it won't matter too much because ultimately we're dealing with the same sorts of things. So I'm skipping past, I'm going to skip past all of the stuff with regard to the player races, because that's not really what we're here for, okay? How's it going, Warren? How are you? It's been a while. Haven't seen you for a long, long time. Glad to have you back. Okay, so <clears throat> skipping all the race stuff, because we don't really need to look at the race stuff. It's the monster stuff that we're need needing to look at, as far as I'm concerned. Ed, in terms of fixing the um, the races, I just don't think that uh, unless people specified like how would I go about doing that, you you compare the playable races if you're going to do that with the original monster and you just make it more like the original monster. That's what I would do. Yep. So we're going to skip all this, and instead I'm going to um, look at some of these creatures and point out a few different things. And then you guys can make some decisions about how, how you go about doing this. So, first off, when I was looking at these stat blocks and comparing them with what they needed to have adjusted, one of the things I found was that armor class was usually pretty, pretty much in line with the challenge rating. It wasn't too far off where it needed to be. Um, so that wasn't too much of a big concern for me. Was, was, uh, armor class was actually not too bad. Um, so you probably won't have to adjust armor class. As for hit points, that's where your biggest problem lies. I did mention this uh, when I was doing the review, right? Is that monsters just don't have enough hit points. So if we look at the Anis Hag, it has 90 hit points, which is slightly more than the original Anis Hag, but the original Anis Hag never had enough hit points anyway. Hello, Ugly Widow. I've never done a survey, but I kind of hate the company um, and don't... Yeah, I, I totally get it. Uh, there's a lot of people who just don't fill them out, I, I, and I get it. So with the Anna's Hag in this example, the easiest way to fix this, I believe, is instead of running it on average, which is just 90, take the formula that's in brackets that says 12d10 plus 24 for the Anna's Hag. Multiply um, 10 by 12, that comes to 120, and then add the 24, so you're going to run your Anis Hag at 120 plus 24 is 144 hit points. Anis Hag should be at least 144 hit points to be able to keep up with your player characters. Otherwise, it's crushed like a buck. Now, you do you, what you do is you do the same thing for all your monsters. Some of the monsters, it won't work. I found there was a couple of monsters are in, in this book where I would have to increase the hit points by 100 and that just wasn't going to be achieved by using this method. But generally, that seems to work with most of the monsters, okay? Uh, we don't need to worry about speed, that's all right. We don't need to worry about their ability scores, that's all cool. Now, they usually have like a saving throw. So if you want to add in an additional saving throw to your creature, that's why you have the proficiency bonus here now, that plus three. So I can now take that number 
And if I want it, want my Anis Hag to be have a saving throw for con saves, it's already included. But if I want to add something in, like uh, intelligence or wisdom, I can now calculate that and add that in. That's why we have the proficiency bonus. So I take my proficiency bonus if I want wisdom, and I go plus three, plus my modifier for wisdom is plus two. Two and three comes five, and I add that in. It now has the saving throw for wisdom as well. So it's there to help you modify the monster. Uh, you can do the same thing with skills. If you decide that deception and percep um, perception are not sufficient for the Anis Hag and we need to have additional skills, then you do that. All right, let me just keep flicking through here a little bit more. And so here, here's, here's our, one of our biggest risks. Legendary creatures are always a huge stat block. It's very easy to get lost amongst these things and, and just to, to forget what to do with these things. Right now, this Astral Dreadnought, even if you do the things that I suggested in terms of hit points and making adjustments to saving throws and skills, which is not absolutely vital at all, okay, your action economy for legendary actions does not work. It says here you get three legendary actions, nowhere near enough for Dungeons and Dragons 5e or 5.5. You'll find, and I do this, and I've discovered that a lot of dungeon masters on YouTube and other people who aren't on YouTube do this. What they do is they allow a legendary action to take place at the end of every player's turn. Some people go with, if I have um, five players, minus one. And so they will allow um, five players, minus one means they get four legendary actions. Now you can do that, that's fine. But I would recommend you do that at the end, you always give your creature as many legendary actions as players. Now the reason is, it compensates for a small group and a large group. If you have a group of only two players, then they're only ever going to have two legendary actions. If you have a group of seven players, it compensates because three legendary actions is not good enough for a group that has seven or eight players. You have to be able to bump it up a bit more. If you run a table of ten players, it, this will not work. Um, Joe Manganello does this. He runs, he basically gives his monsters, if it's legendary, uh, something to do at the end of everybody's turn. So the monster actually does something before it dies, okay? And so it's a challenge. Um, uh, Ugly Widow Fred should just remake the book, start your own D&D. &D. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's not go there just yet, people, okay? Remember, I'm, I'm just some guy on the internet but this is what I do it works for me I know it works for other people okay so that's what I would suggest with legendary actions always as many legendary actions as players also having a claw this dungeon visit and this psychic projection is not enough get rid of the cost of two action points to use this thing or three action points to use the psychic projection bollocks okay add in the, if you want to use a, um, a bite or a claw, that's also something that you can use as a legendary action. All of the standard combat actions that you use in Dungeons & Dragons, uh, add those in as well. Those are all things you could use. As a, so that means you can dodge, disengage, dash uh, with your monster using a legendary action. Give yourself the versatility to make the monster do what it needs to do. Okay? So that would be another thing that I would say about these sorts of things. Um... I'm also going to mention legendary resistance. It says three per day. And I would make your legendary resistances actually equal to the number of player characters you have. Do you know what I mean? Um, just because it, it counters. If you've got a small group of only two players, then there's only going to be two in a day. If you have a, uh, a large group and you have eight players, then you're going to have eight in a day. Because players know that all legendary monsters only have three legendary resistances. So they're trying to burn them up um, and then that's it. Uh, don't worry about the question, it's, it's gone. I've taken it down. Okay? Just post your questions now. I'm watching chat as I go. Okay? As I talk. All right, let's keep moving. Another factor that comes into uh, a lot of this is uh, do, me, do me a favor, people. So, this, see, this monster here has actually been adjusted. Legendary resistance two a day. Why has this one got two a day? It should be just based off the number of players. Do you know what I mean? In my opinion. 
Right, moving along. Um, this is one situation where they have tried to give you additional stuff. I don't like tables that like, this fills up this big space, but really the information's here. This is not great. <laughs> okay. This is much better though. This is a good example of doing the uh, the stat block and the uh, the character a bit more justice. It's a big piece of artwork. I'm not going to give them a hard time about that because I do like artwork. Okay, so moving along to another example. Okay, so let's have a look at something stupid like this, this cattle. Okay. One of the things you'll notice uh, with your monsters in terms of the amount of uh, damage they do is uh, look at the sta uh, look at the challenge rating for your monster. Compare the challenge rating. You have a question there, Wally? Okay, I'll, I'll stop for a second. Um, Fred, if your legendary monster have minions or other monster pres or monsters present that act on different initiative, would you have legendary actions before the minions? The other monster's fun. Um, I, I don't change it. I've Look, uh, Wally, what I've found... I don't know if that necessarily applies to everybody, but I can include minions with a legendary monster and give my legendary monster um, as many legendary mon uh, actions as I have player characters, and my players still wipe the floor. They still wipe the floor. Now, my, the people I'm playing with have been playing for years. They've been playing 5e from the very get-go. Okay, they've been playing a long time. They're all, almost all of them are dungeon masters, so they know the game well. Um, but ultimately, uh, I have to, I have to say that um, yeah, I, I I definitely including minions is fine. But what I've found is when you include minions, what we do is we open up with fireball, clean out the. That's what the players do is they clean out the minions with fireball or an area effect spell. Don't worry about the um, the the legendary creature or monster. Everybody else focuses on that one, and whoever's the spellcaster who can affect the uh, the minions deals with them. Once they're shut down and they're all gone, they move back on to the legendary monster. That is the normal tactic that a player will normally have in a group, is that's the strategy. So, I don't know, does that answer the question? Um, and I do have my minions act on a different initiative to a legendary monster, yes. Be be because they kind of needs to. <laughs> How's it going, Mac, Matt Walker? How are you doing? Um, Scott, uh, I know why you're doing it, Fred, but uh, man, I hate using legendary resistance. It seems unfair to casters, in my opinion. It's not so, so, Scott. I, I know where you're going, coming here from. I'm, I am a big person. I am big on um, spell casting. I, I love playing wizards. I really do. It's one of my, my favorite things to do is to, is to do that sort of thing. But here's the problem. Spell casters are so good at shutting things down and monsters in particular, and particularly legendary monsters. It's always been the case. As soon as you get something like a solo creature, they just can't cope. Yep. And because they can't cope, it's no longer a fun encounter because I can, I can banish them, you know. We we burn up all those um, resistances and and then bam, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone to another dimension, and then we're like, okay, did I just send it back to its original home, or was it currently in its home? And and often they don't wind up coming back. That's that's the problem. Okay, but Scott, you do it the way you want to do it. I do it that way because. I, I know that my players are metagaming the snot out of it. They know the stat blocks well. Um, and also, too, it, by doing it that way, you can compensate for the size of your group because there's not usually a lot of advice around doing that. Let's have a look at the Gorillion. Uh What I'm going to do... Thank you, Wally DM. Thank you, Fred. Great chat today. I have to go, and I understand. Thank you for the $5 super chat. I, I'm glad you were able to catch me too, mate. Um, we'll catch up next week, I believe, isn't it? We're um, we're having a, a get-together next week. Please go and check out Wally's channel at some point. Now, let's talk about attacks. What I want you to do when you're doing your damage, working out your damage, okay, or, you, or your attack, is have a look at the challenge rating first, compare the challenge rating, and then look at the attack bonus. 
because your monster has to hit enough, otherwise it's just not going to work. If the attack bonus is too far out from the challenge rating that it should be, then you need to change it. Now how do you figure that out? You turn to the Dungeon Master Guide, the Quick Build Monster, uh, monster Table, and it lists the challenge rating of a monster, so you, you, you look at your challenge rating for your monster, and then you look at the um, attack bonus, and if the attack bonus is not um, high enough, okay, then you bump it up to where it needs to be, okay? That's what you need to do. Otherwise, your monsters don't hit, hit at all, particularly at high level. <laughs> it's really, really difficult. Um, that's your first thing you want to do. In terms of damage, if they've got multi-attack, then you count up the average damage for all of your monsters, and you compare that on your chart for in the Dungeon Master Guide. Um, now, do I have it close by? No, I don't. I can't show you. Maybe the easiest way to um, to show you that is to maybe I can pull it up and show you this table. I don't know that it's necessarily going to be that easy to do quickly, but. Uh, here it is. This might work. Let me just, sh I'm going to just quickly shift over to that screen because I keep talking about that sort of thing and, and yet you, you can't actually see what I mean. And this is, this is the screen we're going to look at. I'll kind of come back to the book. Don't worry, people. So looking, so look at the monster and mo monsters of the multiverse. Look for the challenge rating. So the challenge rating for our Gorillion was a four, and then we look along. It gives us the proficiency bonus. So if you ever were unsure what to, what the pro pro proficiency bonus was, this table gives it to you. It shows you the armor class. It says it's a fourteen. It, we've got a thirteen for our um, Gorillion. So it's only one down. So it's not that far out. It shows you how many hit points it should have. And you can see that you need to make a fairly significant adjustment to the hit points on the Grillion. The attack bonus says it should be at least a plus five. A plus six is good. Leave it where it is. Okay? Better to go higher than lower. And then it shows you how much damage you should be doing per round. So you look at your um, multi-attack. You add it up. For your Grillion, we get a one bite and four claw attacks. So that would be the bite is seven. And the claw is seven on average in terms of damage. So we add that up. Um, that'll be five sevens is 35. So we're doing 35 points of damage. So we're doing a little bit more than the what we should be doing per round. That's fine. It's better to go higher than lower. Trust me. Okay. The players will cope. They've got enough stuff. They can deal with it. And then it shows you what sort of uh, save DC you should have. So if you go through the monster book and you're thinking that things aren't working right, use this table in the monster and the dungeon master guide as a way of fixing the problem because that will actually help a lot. It's not perfect because nothing can be perfect with regards to um, Dungeons and Dragons mechanics. Okay, remember we're rolling dice, so it's not always going to work, but that's certainly a way of dealing with part of the problem. Uh, what's that, Scott? Yeah, you're right, Fred. Just wish there was another way to give monsters a chance while still giving a caster a chance as well. Here's the thing. Eventually, what's going to happen is the casters will get through. It's only a matter of time. Um, you know, if you have a group of seven players and you have seven uh, legendary resistances, what's going to happen? You're probably going to find that you, they'll burn, try to figure out how to burn up the monster's legendary resistances if there's seven of them and you've assigned seven. So how many rounds is that monster going to probably last? I would say that they're, provided they don't wind up depleting all the hit points, you're probably going to find it's going to take roughly about two or three rounds, two or three rounds before all the legendary resistances are gone and then they're going to hit them with a big, big spell because they'll be saving that up and that'll be the end of the monster. And that'll be your third or fourth round. And legendary monster is no longer part of the equation. So, yeah. I know I know it's it's a little bit hard to sort of swallow sometimes. But that is the best way. Now, um, for those of you who are looking at this and thinking, okay, <clears throat> Fred has suggested that's how I fix my attack, um, uh, attack bonus and, and my damage output for my monsters. What about if I'm finding I got a monster and it's just boring? Because Wizards of the Coast makes a lot of monsters that have only an attack and a claw. 
a bite and bite and claw, bite and claw, bite and claw, bite and claw. And that's that's like annoying. He, Neogi, hatchling. What has it got? It's got spider climb, mental fortitude, and the only thing that it does is bite. That's all it does. So now you're going to make up another attack. Something that you think would make sense based off the lore of the monster. How do you go about doing that? That's what the proficiency bonus is. You're going to add that to whatever you're going to use. You're going to probably be using strength or dexterity if you're making an attack of some kind. If it's a ranged attack, it'll be the dexterity. If it's the strength, it'll be the... Um, um, if it's a melee attack, it'll be the strength uh, um, um, bonus. And then you apply that to it. Um, if you're wanting to, if you want to give it casting, spell, you know, spell casting, well, now you can do that. Okay, you decide which, what is the feature that would be suitable to give it spell casting in this case, particularly when monsters should have spell casting. Okay, or some sort of disease, like if you want to give it spell casting, not necessarily that particular monster, but some other monster. Where can I find one here? Nyogi. Yeah, there aren't. There's, there's a bite and a claw. And this creature apparently is a plague on the, the multiverse. And yet it doesn't feel like it's a plague on the multiverse. The master's a lot better, but just a normal Neogi just seems a bit, bit tame. Now, absolutely it will make a stat block bigger. Um, but sometimes you kind of have to do that to make things work. Do you know what I mean? Each monster should do something special. So you use your... If you're doing spells, you're going to use your proficiency bonus. If it's a saving throw that you're going to be applied at eight plus whatever you're going to use, whatever um, ability um, modifier you're going to use for spell casting, is it intelligence, wisdom, or charisma? And you can figure out that DC for yourself, and you, you so you can build the stuff for yourself that way. So add in stuff. Again, the dungeon master guide has uh, two pages of special abilities that monsters have that aren't spell casting that you can include into monsters when you think that they should have them. Does that make sense? <clears throat> I think that ultimately would, that, that, I think that would be the gist of how to fix them. I mean, if I go try to go through every single one of these, it would be impossible. But I think I've made my point um, with regard to how to fix these little suckers since they are they're not what you wanted like that's not what you were after you were after something else were you not i know i was i bet everybody else was looking for something far more insignificant <clears throat> ugly weirdo weirdo what do you got here at the point uh give every legendary monster um a, a coti i don't know what is that you have to explain a contingent a contingent Anna? What do you mean? You mean an escape route? You can give monsters escape routes, absolutely. Planar gate. Um, so I think a lot of us fail to realize that we need to make our monsters a bit more survivable. So by all means, include spells or things that are in place so that they can escape and come back later on. Um, they might not always work, but yeah, it's good to have that sort of stuff there for sure. Um, Seeker, the the good general tips are handy. Okay, Seeker, so you, you were happy. Those were the general tips. Like I said, um, the Dungeons and Dragons lore and workshop that we do every week is where I, we, we, I will probably be fixing monsters. But it won't be the ones in the Monsters of the Multiverse because most people are using the Monster Manual and that's where we probably need to start. But think about it. Last week we only did two monsters. What we did, the Boule. And we covered the Manticore. So we did some adjustments to those two monsters. So if I can only do two adjustments to, um, to monsters every week, uh, at the best, you're probably getting maybe maybe 48 weeks in a year. You multiply that by two. So that's just, o just over 90 monsters. And there's 400 monsters in the monster manual. And there's 250 at least and monsters of the multi um, multiverse. So it's going to take a long time to get that done. So a lot of you are going to have to do this work without without me, unfortunately. Uh, and I'm sure you already are. I mean, frankly, I, I think a lot of you probably already know what you're talking. Hi, Mike. How's it going, Michael? How are you? Um, 
it's sad that this book is uh, replacing two other books filled with really in-depth lore. Yeah, it has. And also maps and other resources. I mean, a lot of it's really, really useful. Party of Seven. So, um, Warren, uh, I, I, I used to struggle finding people to play with, but I don't have any problems anymore. Uh, probably a product of being... I guess, submerged into the D&D community so much. I've also built the community in New, in New Zealand quite significantly. Uh, it is much stronger than it has ever been, and everybody's come out of the basement, um, out of the dark, into the light again. And so, we, we, you know, it's not hidden like it was before. It was very, very hidden before. It was very hard to find people, for sure. Uh, now, um, was there anything else people wanted me to mention? in terms of like what I would do with this book. Uh, look, for some of you who've already got it, but need to use it. I mean, even if you're dealing with uh, Volo's Guide to um, Monsters or um, Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, you're probably going to need to make adjustments to those monsters anyway, because they're just not going to be good enough to make to deal with everything. Um, <coughs> For, for the life of me, uh, for the life of me, I am, <laughs> I struggle to figure out and, and work out how many people I have as patrons uh, on my uh, Patreon right now. And uh, and I see a new Dana name in there and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm sure they were a patron. And of course, things have changed over time. And it's not always necessarily the case. Um, but, 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 but yeah, all of the stat blocks that I create on uh, on this channel or modify or remaster they all go up onto patreon too by the way if anybody who was unaware they do they will wind up there for sure <clears throat> uh so i think we have kind of come to the end of this right i so really enjoyed tonight's stream to be on um um by the way save the date for drag lance fred save the date yeah, but Seeker, do I do I do I do it using D and D Beyond and reviewing it? The problem is, it would take me a little bit of time to review the document anyway. And um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm assuming people want me to talk about uh, Spelljammer, the Spelljammer books. Like, I mean, I'm, I I I want to review the Spelljammer books. There's a little bit of stuff for players, but I would not buy it. If you're a player, don't buy the book, okay? It's a waste of your time. It's it's a waste of your money. You know, the funny thing about this book that we have here, this silly thing here was supposed to condense books that were made using the concept that we must have Dungeon Master and player stuff in every book, right? So be because of the way that they have structured their books in the past... They decided to use this as a way of of pulling everything together, and yet they still haven't done this. They have insisted on trying to have a section that's just for players, which is the playable races in it. So they've made the same mistake that they that has caused this book to be necessary. If they never um, created uh, Volo's Guide to Monsters or Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, half and half, and they just put all the stat blocks and all the lore for those monsters in the same book, this would never have been needed, right? They could have done that years ago. And yet they're still following that stupid um, marketing ploy, which is we have to have a little bit for players and something for Dungeon Masters or a lot for players and a little bit for Dungeon Masters so that both of them are buying the book. I can assure you they have no idea I can't count the number. If a player has money, they buy monster books. I know I've seen it happen more than a few times. <laughs> if they don't have money, they don't buy it. Ugly Weirdo, you don't buy anything from Wizards of the Coast? Yeah, it's a little bit frustrating. So Spelljammer, I'm going to break up all the books. I'm not going to do them all together. I'm going to do each book separately, okay? Because I think, to be fair, that's how it needs to be done. Um, it was hard work to put all of this together just for this one book. It took me a lot of time. Um, I'm probably going to wind up talking about the Critical Role book because I have it uh, that was released. 
um, the new one. I can't remember. Is it the, the, the Nether Deep book? So I'll, I'll do a, a review of that. Same sort of format. I will lay it out, talk about it, flip through the pages so you can see everything. Um, when I get when I'm able to get hold of the physical product, I will do a review of um, the new starter box set, and I will go through the adventure that is included in there, which is Dragons of Stormwreck or um, Stormwreck Isle. I mean, I, I mean, I've got access to it on D and D Beyond, yes, but I still want to use the physical book as such. Um, what else is I? What else do I have here? I have a, a a a book that has a collection of short adventures that I might actually talk about as well at some point. I might review that. Um, the only reason I haven't is I didn't feel like it was a very good book, and I was like, do I really want to review a book and say this isn't very good? How useful is that to you? Um, the only book I will not probably review. I think I've done, did I not do Van Richten's Guide to Everything? I thought I had done Van Richten's Guide to Everything. I could swear that I have. Let me just, let me just type it in here. I'm sh I could swear that I did that. Van Richten. Yes, there is, there is a review of Van Richten and it's a flip through as well. So that's, here's the, Here's the, let me just grab this thing for you. So I did actually review that book. It's already been done. Uh, paste. Um, I appreciate you did, um, you did a Strad thing. Yeah, no, I, sorry, yeah. Uh, well, because it's hard to find everything on my channel. Do you know what I mean? Third party adventure book. It is a third party adventure book, but it's not from By Wizards of the Coast. Um, the only book I probably will not do a review on or talk about, just from sheer fear of the crazy people on both sides of the fence, those people who hate the book and those people who love the book, uh, because I don't want to be squished in the middle by those crazy people, is um, Journey Beyond the Crystal Citadel. Um, I think that's what it's called. It's I think that's the book. Um, pretty sure that's what it's called. The Radiant Citadel. Yeah, Journey Beyond the Radiant Citadel. I I I am not reviewing that book on on my channel, because um, of the backlash and just the crazy people who have uh, had things to say either against the book or for the book. Yeah, the Radiant Citadel is like a hot. Um, hotbed of disaster for me. That, now, the reason, my reason for not reviewing it is not because I think it's a bad book, or it's a good book. Um, I don't, it's not. It's got nothing to do with that. It's just because the community is insane around this book, and I, I refuse to do a review when people cannot behave like mature beings, and um, and allow for open discussion about something and for somebody to to put, uh, to give out a um, an opinion on a book without just being just weird <laughs> just weird I, I just don't want to do that uh, but yes Dragonlance will get done I would prefer to do the physical book rather than we'll see we'll see how I feel about this I, I don't know I, I'm, I'm still the Dragonlance book is an adventure book, and there's a problem with adventure books, and um, and Dragonlance has an adventure book rather than a campaign setting is not really what I was after, but yeah, um, 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 Seeker, it will probably happen. Uh, just say it already, uh, McLovin, <laughs> community is insane regardless. Yeah, I, I know, but. Seriously, I I just I talked about the Radiant Citadel, and I had to, I we had we had two people who had to take down videos because of it. That I was a part of, they had both those videos had to go down. Um, so you know the the reality is, because I'm white, I'm a man, I'm fifty one, um, a lot of people view me as the enemy, and. Nothing that I say is going to help. And I'm really quite serious. 
Yes, two videos were taken down. I'm not going to tell you which channels, okay? And I was on part of those discussions, and the people who had issues with it, their reason for having an issue with it was weird. And I, I, I can't, I, I mean, it was, it was so strange. It was so, so strange because the, the, the feedback I was giving was not, I was not giving, I was not saying the book was bad or anything like that. It was, it was nothing like that. It was just bizarre. So yeah, not going to get involved. <clears throat> um, now, what else is there? Do you know that I have a lot of old books here, which I could show and talk to about? Like, even if we haven't got new publications, over the Christmas period, a lot of people don't watch YouTube. So I am quite happy to um, go through uh, books like, um, I've got the original Star Wars saga books. I've got a lot of 4E books. Now, yes, I know 4E is not super popular. I understand this. Um, I have Warhammer Dark Heresy. Uh, I would be happy to go through that as well. I have, um, I've got a bunch of books from, that have older games there. Like, so there is an option to do some of the older stuff as well. Now, you're not, you're not going to be able to buy the original book, but you could buy the PDF. Um, I'm probably not going to necessarily going to get any money out of you going and buying that in PDF, but that's all right. I don't really care about that. But yeah, we'll, we'll see how we go with this. We'll see how, I mean, reviews usually don't do that well. Um, but I'm certainly open to the idea of talking about some of the older books. What's the time now? Um, I demand you swap out that hat for a sci-fi hat if you do Star Wars. Oh, okay. Three times Lords of Madness would be a fun stream. Lords of Madness? I don't even know if I've got Lords of Madness. Uh, I, I may have Lords of Madness. I can't remember. Do I, do I grab you... Do I grab some of the other books that I've got here? No. No, I won't. No. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, I, I think this is a good point to stop. Do you know what I mean? I've talked about Monsters of the Multiverse. There's some good stuff, some bad stuff. Ultimately, it's not the book that I um, I was hoping for. And, and frankly, I don't think a lot of people were looking for that kind of book. They, they were looking for something else. Some old a and D's lore, and it was good. Yeah, uh, so... Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, the original Dungeons and Dragons uh, did not have a lot because they just, the word count was the issue. But once we get into Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, they do an awful lot with um, with lore. Uh, this week, coming up, uh, in a couple of days, I'll be doing the Lost Mod of Fandelva. I'll be going back to the very beginning because we've done Ruins of Thunder Tree and I'll be going to intro and talking about the Goblin Ambush. After that, we're doing another DM preparation. I can't remember which it is. I think it's e I think it's creating locations or it's creating like not cre is it is it creating monsters? It might be creating monsters. I can't remember which one of those. It's a dungeon master preparation the day after, and this week after that one would be monster lore and workshop, and I'll be covering the Umber Hulk, and then we're doing another beginner character creation um, stream, and then the day after that is. Um, complex combat mechanics, and then we'll be I'll be covering one of the spell chamber books as a review for the end of for 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 the the end of the week basically. Okay, it's time for me to go. I've said enough. I'm losing my voice anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's cycle on out, shall we? So I would just like to say thank you to everybody who has been a patron and supporting me on Patreon. It does really make a huge difference. I do appreciate it. I also would like to call out and thank Seeker um, for his um, support. I would also like to thank everybody who takes part and comes to these live streams. I know they are long, so thank you for coming to them and watching them live and also participating in the comments section uh, or watching the replays of the live streams. It's actually really, really helpful. Watching my edited videos and putting up with my shorts I do the shorts because YouTube really needs me to do them. If I don't, my my channel dies. So I'm trying to do shorts that will appeal to people and drive people to the longer content. Yeah. Um, 
So thank you very much for watching and being part of the channel. And also, uh, wherever you are in the world, whether it be the morning, the afternoon, or the night, or the wee wee early morning, please look after yourself, your family, and your friends. Be nice to your neighbours. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.